All right, so thanks for making it out here tonight, guys. We are going to be talking about the teleological argument for God, or what is also known as the fine-tuning argument. So this one, I actually have like a love-hate relationship with this, because there's so many different directions you could go with this. Like, uh, I know in the book that I read, uh, The Cosmological well, the Case for God by J. Warner Wallace, he had things... You can talk about the universe that are fine-tuned, things about people that are fine-tuned, and like, you can go forever on animals as far as like different aspects of animals that are fine-tuned that couldn't just necessarily happen on their own that show design. So I had a, a hard time trying to narrow down what I wanted to talk about. So it was a little hard to figure it out now. And in another respect, like the moral argument for God, that really doesn't change as far as the argument goes. Like it's pretty static for the most part, uh, whereas this tends to change a little bit as our understanding of animals and people, it changes over time. You kind of have to check back on the science every so often just to make sure that what you're saying is uh, correct. So it does tend to change a little bit more. And another thing I just want you guys to remember, like, you do not have to remember all this stuff. This is way, way too much information to like, try and tell any one person at one time, so... Challenge accepted. <laughs> there you go, Daniel, I like the attitude. Man. So, just remember that out of this series, like, I don't expect y'all to remember everything at all. Just pick one that you, like, really like, and I'd say dive deep into that one, and, like, you're not gonna learn everything just from me talking about it. Like, try and find a book about it or some sort of article and, like, find out more that you like. So, this one here, I've never actually used as far as talking to an individual about here's the fine-tuning argument, here's different aspects. I've never gone all the way through on any of these examples. So don't feel like you've got to memorize all these. This is, and I don't have all these memorized. That's why I have a PowerPoint slide. Just remember that. So here is the thought behind the teleological argument. So we have the thought that if the universe shows evidence for purposeful design, there must be a designer. And the universe does show evidence for this, so there must be a designer. Pretty simple thought process, but we'll walk through what that looks like exactly. So I've broken it up into three different categories we're going to look at tonight for this teleological argument. I'm just going to call it fine-tuning from now on because it's a little bit of a mouthful. Uh, we're looking at the design of the universe specifically the gravitational force and the cosmological constant. And then we're going to look at the design of the human body. Uh, one of the popular examples for design is the human eye. That's what, if you ever hear someone giving this argument, they're most likely going to talk about the human eye. And then my favorite thing about the design for the human body is the DNA code. Uh, I'll show you a little bit how I like to talk to people about that specifically. And then the show is not just the universe, it's not just humans, it's also animals have some sort of uh, intelligent design in them. So my favorite example is the giraffe. So we're going to show, talk about that in a little bit. All right, so let's set it up. What, what's the struggle that we're having here as far as having intelligent design? There's scientists on both sides. So some say no, it just appears to have intelligent design. It's not actual intelligent design. But the interesting thing to note is that they'll admit that it at least looks like intelligent design. Like, if everything was random, it really shouldn't look like there's any type of design to that. So the fact that they're even willing to admit that kind of is a vote in our favor. Um, just to give you some quotes from people who don't agree with this, just so we can show both sides of the argument, we've got Richard Dawkins here. He says, there may be good reasons for belief in God, but the argument from design is not one of them. Despite all appearances to the contrary, there is no watchmaker in nature beyond the blind forces of physics. And by no watchmaker, he means no creator, no designer. And so that's his viewpoint on that one. Again, I would argue he, even if God was real, he wouldn't care or want to know on that one. But I'll let you decide for yourself on that one. There's a little bit more of his quotes. Uh, I'm not going to read it off for you, I'll just let you take a look at that one. Um, and then we've also got Stephen Hawking, who also commented on this, and he actually admitted, said, well, there is some sort of design to the universe, or that there, it appears 
Our universe and law appear to have a design that is both tailor-made to support us and, if we are to exist, leaves little room for alteration. Which, that's an admission that leaves that there appears to be some sort of design, whether he believes that there is or not. But as you can see at the bottom of the quote, he does not believe that there is actual intelligent design. Now, here's why I disagree with him and several other scientists do as well. So, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of Robert Jastrow. Uh, he's an astronomer, or he was an astronomer. Uh, very well thought of back in the day. And here's his quote. He was actually agnostic for, I think, most of his life, if not all of his mm -hmm. life. So the fact that he is even saying this is kind of a win for us. Uh, it says, astronomers now find they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in the cosmos, and on the earth, and they have found that all this happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover. That there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. So really, he's saying there's someone's been monkeying with the design. There's someone who's had a hand in creating all this. So it shows that there's other scientists that believe this as well. Um, so that's one scientist, and just so we have two of both, we have Robert Wilson as well. Uh, he also did not believe in Christianity, from what I can tell. He was a big fan of the steady state theory, which from lesson two we talked about was the idea that the universe had always existed into the past forever. And that was his thought originally, but if you look at his quote here, it says, and clearly I've had to give that up. In an interview with, his, uh, with Fred Heron, he was asked if the Big Bang evidence is indicative of creator and said, certainly there was something that set it off. Certainly if you're religious, I can't think of a better theory of the origin of the universe to match his hypnosis. His quote there saying the Big Bang seems to match Genesis the best of all the theories out there, and astronomers have literally painted themselves into a corner saying there had to be a beginning to the universe. There's like there's really hardly any way to get around that. And so by doing that you're getting back to the Genesis story. So there you go, there's a couple of scientists on both sides of the the aisle there. I'll let you make your decision on that one. Alright, now let's talk about the actual fine tuning. Um, we've got gravitational force here. I'll let y'all read the definition. Um, yeah, I think y'all know what gravi gravity is for the most part. Uh, what I found really interesting is really how much leeway you have as far as changing things. So there is not a whole lot of room to mess with the different forces out there. We've got gravitational force, we've got electromagnetic force, cosmological constant. All these different forces are have to be within a certain ratio of each other or else life doesn't exist at all. And if you mess with it just a little bit, it throws everything else off. So we take gravity for example. If gravity is weaker by 1 in 1036 parts, stars are unstable to, to generosity and pressure for small stars are unstable to radiative pressure. Sorry, I'm not good at pronouncing this stuff, guys. Uh, they just end up expelling huge chunks of gas and cannot form into actual stars. And if gravity is stronger by 1 in 1040, the universe is dominated by black holes, not stars. No planets, no stars, no light. Nothing exists at that point. And that's just by moving it just by one part in over a thousand parts. But let's look at something else on gravity. So the fact that gravity is at a certain ratio isn't just a mistake or just happened that way. Uh, if the expansion rate of the universe had deviated by more than 1 in 10 to 37, so that's 1 with 37 zeros, or the mass density of the universe had varied by 1 in 10 to 59, so 59 zeros, there wouldn't be a single habitable galaxy or planet in the universe. So nobody would be alive at all if it changed by just that little. Now those are such big numbers, it's really hard to get an idea of like what that means. So this is the example I found. 
of 10 to the 60th power. Uh, imagine trying to fire a bullet at a one inch target on the other side of the observable universe. So not the other side of the planet, not the other side of our solar system, but the other side of the observable universe and hitting that, a one inch target. That would be one in 10 to the 60th power. So that's how likely that it's, uh, that's the randomness, if you will, like, we need to have that much accuracy. I don't know how you can explain, say, it just happened that way. To me, having that fine tuning so that the universe could exist and support life just beckons that there is a designer. So that we've gotten into some details here. So, did anybody have any questions so far? Anything? So, the limit of that is zero. So, <laughs> Man, this is equal to zero, is what you're saying? On that one? one yeah. Zero. yeah, I mean, it's very close to zero. It's very close to zero. It's a very, very tiny number. The limit doesn't exist. It does exist, it's zero. <laughs> right, to, to Isabel's point, like, at what point do you say it's not, it's impossible? Like, yes, there is a, a chance, but like, it's so small that it's next to zero. So, something to think about on that one. We're going to talk about the cosmological constant now. Now this one's a little bit of a confusing idea, but the, the premise behind it is that there is expansion to the universe. So we, the universe isn't contracting, it's not staying still per se, it is constantly expanding outward, and that's at a certain rate. Now, uh, that rate is specific rate and that it is counterbalanced by gravity to a certain extent. So if gravity was a whole was much stronger, the universe actually wouldn't be expanding, it'd be contracting. But the problem with the universe contracting is it would come in on itself and eventually destroy itself. And there would be no life that would be suitable. But if the universe were expanding much faster, that would be also be an issue. You have to hit the right balance just to make sure that we're not all flying off into the middle of nowhere kind of thing. Um, hit the right balance, the cosmological constant must be fine-tuned to something like 1 in 10,120 parts. If it were slightly negative, the universe would collapse. Um, see here. I think I have some more to this too as well. All right. Here, I'll give you a few other ratios here. Um, as with the cosmological constant, the ratio of other constants must be fine too. To get a handle, um, we have to, com to get an idea of this, we have to compare to other forces as well, just so we, there's not a good like beginning point for any of these forces, we can only compare them to, to each other and to make it make sense. We didn't talk about the strong nuclear force, but that's also an example of fine tuning as well. That's the idea of uh, what's keeping atoms together. So that's a very strong bond. It's much stronger than gravity, about 10,040 times stronger than that. Um, and really it's billion, billion, billions of times. Uh, so if you think of that range represented by a ruler stretching across the entire observable universe, about 15 billion light years. If we increase the strength of gravity just by one part in 1,034 of that range, uh, the universe would not have life-sustaining planets at that point. So just one in, in, in 1,034 parts, none of us would be alive. I have a hard time again believing that that just happened that way. And not that this just happened, but if you think about it, the uh, cosmological constant also has to be in ratio to gravity. So it has to change as well as gravity would on that one. And Every other, there's two other forces, including the electromagnetic force. Um, they all have to be in just the right ratio of each other. So if any one of them are off, that pretty much ruins the chance of life. So you have, again, like the book I mentioned, they, they mentioned five. You could probably get up to ten uh, different things that have to be all in the right ratio with each other just to sustain life. And the idea of even getting three is pretty astronomical as far as getting those correct to sustain life. So the idea of just happening again is extremely difficult to be realistic. Any questions so far? All right, has 
anyone heard of irreducible complexity before? Yeah, no, you have? Okay, we got one guy. So we're Oh, we got two, we got two. All right. So the idea behind irreducible complexity, uh, there's a definition up here, but the way I like to remember it is you can reduce something down to its most basic parts, and at some point it ceases to function if you remove one part of it. And that's the idea behind irreducible complexity. So there's a whole bunch of different things we could talk about on this one. Um, Flagellum in the cell is often one that's used for intelligent design. That's not necessarily my favorite, so I didn't include it on here, but that's sure. uh, one that a lot of people like to talk about. And we're going to talk about some of the ones in our bodies as well. But it's really like, it goes against the idea of evolution in that you can't have things just slowly come together over time and work for these objects. So like we're going to talk about the eye. The eye has to have everything functioning at the same time, all at once. It can't just have a part missing and then the next generation it gets it and it starts working. It's the idea that everything has to be started at the same time for it to function or else it will cease to exist. So that's what we're going to talk about with irreducible complexity. Of the human eye. Here we go. Does anyone recognize I've that been eye? There, actually. You've been there, yeah, it's in Dallas. So. Whoa! In downtown. There you go. Alright, so this is probably the most popular example for intelligent design is, that, is the eye. It's the most complex uh, thing in the human body, you could argue. argue. Um, I found this. Uh, Scientist actually, Dr. George Marshall, he's got a really interesting story. If you ever get a chance to look him up, and he he had uh, basically had an injury to his eye at one point, but uh, he was able to gain his sight back and became uh, an eye doctor and or eye research scientist, if you will. And he just like devoted his life to studying the eye. And he had some interesting quotes. Uh, so he says, I see the miracle of the complexity on viewing things at 100,000 times magnification. Basically that's what our eyes do. It magnifies everything that's coming in by 100,000 times, which is pretty crazy to think about. I don't know how many cameras can do that. Maybe they can or can't, but uh, really for our sight to even work, that's what we have to have happen. Um, it's the perfection of this complexity that caused me to balk at evolutionary theory. Is, he goes on to say that the retina is probably the most complicated tissue in the whole body. Millions of nerve cells interconnect in a fantastic number of ways to form a miniature brain. Much of what the photoreceptors see is interpreted and processed by the retina long before it enters the brain. So really, not only is your eye super complex, but the information it receives and is going to send to the brain, it has to send to a processor before it can go to the brain, because the brain cannot handle how much information is coming in. So you think about it, your eye has a computer for your brain that's a computer. That's pretty complex in my opinion. Uh, and it's, it's amazing what the eye can do. I am doing a very high level summary of this. I cannot go into all the detail that is out there. Highly recommend if you, if you want to look into something, this is a great one to look at. It's very relatable for people as we all have eyes. So mm -hmm. makes a little more sense sometimes. Yeah. I know uh, Richard da or, um, Charles Darwin actually wrote in The Origin of Species how he's baffled at the complexity of the eye and how it couldn't have formed from, from chance. And then proceeded to write three pages about how it just came from chance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is crazy to think about. Um, one of the, again, this goes back to how the science changes over time so to a certain extent. The biggest complaint atheists have put out there is they'll argue that the eye is formed backwards. So I'll tell you what I mean by that. The idea is that your eye, it has a processor and it's, so your, your light comes in this way, it bounces off the wall in your eye and it bounces to a receptor that's here. And the argument is, why would you do that? That's backwards. Well, how does that show design? Shouldn't the receptor be facing outward? So if the light comes in through your eye, it hits a receptor versus being faced the opposite way, bouncing off the wall and coming back. Well, the question you have to ask is, do you know the original design purpose? 
you think about it, if, if I don't know what something was originally designed for, how can I say if it's designed correctly or not? So that's the first question I would always ask when someone says, well, this doesn't show design because of that. Well, how do you know the purpose? Um, another way that we can talk about that, well, actually Dr. Marshall goes on to talk about it a little bit. He says, the notion that the eye was wired backwards occurred as a 13-year-old. Um, it took him two years of studying the eye to realize that the eye, the eye is wired a certain way. The idea that it's wired backwards comes from a lack of knowledge of eye function and anatomy. So he's really saying the people that claim it's backwards really don't understand what it's being used for. Um, thinking about it, uh, the, what they compare it to normally is an octopus's eye. So an octopus's eye is face forward, so it allows more light, so light can get in that way. But an octopus is usually in the ocean. Like they're not sticking their heads outside the water much. They're usually in darker areas, actually. So they need to be able to receive more light because there's just not much down there. Whereas human eyes, we're out in the sun, we're outside a lot. Our eyes, if they got direct sunlight, just like from our normal everyday experience, they would actually burn up. They would not function correctly. So the fact that it, the, the receivers are reversed is actually saving us from hurting ourselves. So that is the purpose behind having a, a processor for your eye like that. And again, that takes some thought process and some understanding of what the eye serves for as a purpose. Uh, if you don't know what the purpose behind it, then you can't really know if it's designed correctly. Another way to think about it is an architect will tell you, you have to change sizes of different things depending on how much space you're working with. So take this house, for example, we've got a town home here. There's a limited amount of space that this house can exist in. If you make the backyard bigger, you got to make the house smaller. That's just a limitation of what you have. Same thing with the eye. Whatever you have in there, you have a limited space that you can put it in. And if something is bigger, something else is going to have to be smaller. And so that's another way to think of when you hear other arguments about fine tuning, especially like if you're in a limited space, like, okay, maybe something is smaller than you would prefer, but like, it's fitting into a limited space and, as well, and if you want other things to function correctly, maybe they need to be bigger. This, this is more, again, conversational pieces rather than specifically the eye, but it's a good way to ask questions of people, being like, if you really have a problem with this, have you thought about this? Yeah. And another thing on the eye is, if you removed any piece of the eye, it would cease to function. Like if there's any functional piece in there is, if you remove it and say we're not going to have any more of this, it's not going to work. And it's not necessarily something that would develop over generations. Because like, what? Let me put it this way: What likelihood would the animal have if it doesn't have eyes of surviving? It could get by on other senses, but how is it first going to know to develop an eye if it's getting by without it? And if it doesn't have it, like how is it going to know to develop it too? Mm -hmm. So those are questions to ask. Only it's talking about, I would say, large jumps in evolution. It's not cool. So because like the, in order for like the lens of the eye to form, it has to form based off of like the material inside the eye. So like light actually reflects it refracts differently than when it like enters one medium and goes to another. So you have to know what the inside like gel is going to look like, and the and then you form the the, um, the lens accordingly. Yeah. So if you don't have both in, in correct, then your eye is actually going to have like light splitting, or you'll see rainbows and stuff like that because like yeah. the light isn't focused correctly. Right. I mean the the focus point for light is like so small that if you don't have the lens right, it's going to mess everything else up. So I don't know if I raced through that, but did y'all have any questions about that before I moved on? I'm not an expert on eyes, this is just a, a very high level review I've got for you. I have a feeling this lesson is going to be a little bit faster just because this is a little bit more informational than debatable, we might say. Uh, but this is my favorite example, actually, of the fine-tuning argument. It's the human DNA. Uh, I really like the way that uh, there's a channel on YouTube called Living Waters, how they present it to people and present the gospel using this. And it's really neat in that they 
they help you understand that DNA really is a book and it has a, an author. So here's what I mean by that. So really our DNA is a chemical coding. By coding I mean it's similar in that we have zeros and ones for our coding for whenever we're doing a computer program, right? Same thing's happening with DNA. We have coding built into our DNA, but it's in chemical form instead of like a physical, like on a disk or hard drive. And there's so much information packed into DNA. Before I studied this, I didn't even realize how much information can be held in DNA. Um, I have the technical name up there, but it's the largest molecule known to man. It contains over 10 billion atoms. So this is this huge molecule that has an enormous amount of information. And it's the same thing, like if, if I was gonna talk to someone and try to explain to them the fine-tuning argument, I would take a book like this and I'd say, hey, we've got a colored book here and it's got writing in it, it's got thoughts, it's got patterns. What do you think the likelihood of this book just coming together on its own? Just out in nature, just somehow the words appeared on pages, the pages got binded together, and it's a coherent thought throughout the book. Like what is what do you think the likelihood that this book just came together? I'm gonna say ten out of ten people are gonna say that's never gonna happen. Like some someone or something had to put that together. Same concept for DNA. It is so complicated and it it has so much logic built into it. It is I don't know how anyone can deny that there wasn't a master code writer for this. And I don't know if anyone got a chance to look at the uh, Slack channel that we have out there, but I posted a video that's talking about it. And it's a guy who's not necessarily even a Christian. And he's been doing this huge amount of research on DNA. It's really cool. They've gotten to the point that they can read your DNA code and predict what your face is going to look like, like when you turn 25, basically. So like, in theory, you can take a baby, take the blood, and figure out what the baby's face is going to look like when he's 25. So, kind of scary, but kind of cool at the same time. <laughs> Highly recommend watching the video if you got time. It's a TED Talk, takes 16 minutes. Good, good talk. Uh, here's just another example. This is, I got straight from the video. He said, roughly 262,000 worth of pages, of finely printed pages. Not just like big words, I'm talking about finely printed pages of information are in your DNA. And that's like in a strand of DNA. <laughs> it's crazy how much information is. 175 books in a strand of DNA. And they literally printed out all like all 262,000 pages and put them in, in books for his TED talk and just wheeled them all out there just to give you an idea of how much it is. It's Amazing how much information can be stored in DNA. In you know, 175 books, I don't think I've read 175 books in my life. So uh, I feel like I'm an average reader, but I don't think I've done that many. Maybe Kelsey's done more, but you know, yeah. <laughs> she's done more that year. Yeah, I think. Uh, to, I think that's the yeah. It's the, oh, huh. Infinite Monkey Theorem, yeah, that Shakespeare. Um, well, there was one more slide. I don't know why it's not showing up right now, but um, the slide was really interesting. In what? Do you have a question? Or no, no, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I get distracted easy. It's just, it's crazy. Again, watch the video. It's amazing how much information can be stored in there. So, he's. They said that. It's a guesstimate on how much information can be stored in there from our perspective. They said the accepted range is about 215 petabytes of information can be stored on there. And based on that calculation, every written down or coded piece of information that exists in the world right now could be contained in two and a half pounds of DNA. So. Oh like less than most weights you have in your house. Like it could be contain all of the known information that's written down and on YouTube, on computers, all fit in two and a half pounds. And that's how complex it is. And we just want to say that just happened. You know? Yeah, it just may have may have come together by chance. We got lucky. Yeah. So 
big, it's a big gap on there. That's why it's one of my favorites to talk about. It's just like so overwhelming for me to think about on that one. Um, this may be a good stopping point here, just to uh, take a break, stretch your legs, use the restroom, and oh, we got a question first, though. Well, it's more like comment. The, the, the other problem with the serum is assuming everything is paired. So yeah. those, the amino acids to make our DNA, they don't want to come together like that. Like there are mm -hmm. spe special chemicals like replicase that, that are specifically for putting these amino acids together. Yeah. Like it's, it requires, you require um, fighting against Osmosis, all these different kinds of, you need protections for the for this um, for this uh, for this process to happen. It's like I think one of the prevailing notions is like it started in like some thermal in the ocean or something. Yeah. yeah, some yeah, some thermal vent. But like it's what about everything else in the ocean? They don't these these complex organic chemicals, they don't want to just come together. For sure, they. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but you have to have some sort of structure inside of a cell to create DNA. But that cell needs information to be created, kind of thing. So it's chicken and egg theory. But we'll we'll come to that in here in a little bit, and we'll go ahead and take a break real quick.